Bien, y ahora vamos a dar paso a la siguiente presentación. Mientras se conecta, he visto que Eduard estaba aquí. Perfecto. Eh, tenemos el, el placer de contar con nosotros a un especialista invitado de la otra banda del, del Atlántico que nos va a hablar de, de las eh, tecnologías basadas en fibras de, en el caso de, la, de, de, la, de América. Eh, el profesor uh, Edward Jolie él es profesor de la Universidad en, de Arizona. ¿eh? De la, trabaja en el Arizona State Museum y la, y la Escuela de Antropología. Eh, él es antropólogo y su interés está centrado principalmente en estas tecnologías perecederas, eh, cuerdas, redes, cestería, textiles. Eh, ha trabajado un poco en general, en, toda, en diferentes lugares del mundo, eh, pero centrándose específicamente, bueno, especialmente en la arqueología y etnología de, de las Américas. Eh, nos va a presentar, por lo tanto, eh, su conocimiento sobre este, esta temática tan interesante que nos ocupa hoy. Eh, Edward, welcome. Uh, the presentation will be in English. I didn't say nothing about this. And I hope you can follow. I, uh, and uh, when you want, you can start with your presentation. presentation. Thank you. Great, excellent. Uh, gracias, Raquel. So I will attempt to share my screen now. Okay. okay. Great, can you see that okay? Yes. Excellent. Well, um, I hope this finds you all safe and healthy. Thank you very much for having me. It's a, a real pleasure to participate, uh, even if only virtually I can be there in Barcelona with you. Uh, I'm grateful to Raquel for extending the invitation and to Anna for all her help making this possible. My job today is, is a pretty easy one, and that is to talk to you about archeology span and ancient weaving traditions in the Americas. So that's pretty much the entire Western hemisphere is seen here on this map, except for Greenland, of course. What I want to do is to provide some general context it is focused today on, on fiber based weaving traditions that is textiles and basketry of the Americas and more specifically what the archaeological landscape of such crafts looks like prior to contact with settler colonists beginning in 1492. Now to do justice to the rich indigenous craft traditions of the entirety of the Americas would require many, many volumes and it might seem foolish for me to take on such a broad geographic approach. But my argument is that when we work with such a small piece of the archaeological record, and one that rarely preserves, it's too easy to miss the wider cultural and geographic connections if we're not looking at what adjacent or neighboring cultures have been doing. So my hope is that in the next half hour, I can give you a brief taste of or introduction to what the archaeological record from the Americas looks like and how research on textiles here might provide examples of common ground for research or even new ideas that you can take away with you in your own research. There's much to be gained by looking at similar technological traditions and thinking about the social, cultural, and environmental circumstances that might have shaped the regional diversification of these traditions at different social and cultural scales. I often jokingly say that I like to cast a broad net in my research. And by this, I mean that I like to look far and wide for technological and cultural connections, certainly beyond political boundaries, but also searching for technological affinities across space and through time. But I'm also looking for technological affinities. And this is so that I can think about the big picture. I'm interested in archaeology of the Americas because it is in part my own family history. But also as an anthropologist, I find that it helps inform the way that we think about the origins and development of contemporary cultural diversity and helps teach us about past human cooperation and conflict that might have lessons for us today. So I have a broad overview map here. Uh, obviously showing you sort of the, the major geographic regions, sort of a very broad, rough sort of geography in the Americas, uh, with a, a selection of, of some examples of perishable artifacts, in this case, some textiles and basketry. We have a couple of examples here from the Western United States. Uh, hopefully you can see my, let's see my mouse pointer here. Uh, we have a, a textile fragment that's a um, diamond twill tapestry from the American Southwest. Oops. We have a uh, feathered basketry hat that's about 1300 years old uh, from the Great Basin region, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Uh, water bird feathers decorating a, a quill basketry hat that was worn by probably a small young woman or a child. 
We have some examples of the really spectacular, famous, uh, intricate, and sophisticated Peruvian textiles from, from the Andes of South America, including some really amazing feather work. And then of course, uh, sandwiched in between, we have some of the really amazing uh, traditions of textiles that are, aren't as well preserved from Mesoamerica. The example at the bottom there is a feathered uh, 16th century, uh, or late 15th century shield uh, from Mixtec or Aztec uh, peoples of Mexico. And of course, uh, an example of a beautiful embroidered or brocaded uh, Mayan huipile uh, type of garment. So I should say, uh, before going further, I, I mentioned that it's my family history, and it is in fact my family history. Uh, I'm an enrolled citizen of the Muscogee Creek Nation of Oklahoma, so I have family ties to uh, uh, ancestors who come from the southeastern United States in traditional Creek territory, but I also have uh, uh, in my family ancestors from the uh, vicinity of southern South Dakota, uh, the Ogla Lakota or Sioux peoples, and what you see here is the basket that got me started in this sort of research area. It's a, a small coiled gambling basket. It's a type of a basketry, which is one of the few types of basketry that was produced historically among the Indians of the Great Plains of North America. Rightly so, most Native Americans of the Plains are, are, are well known and, and their art celebrated for the elaborate hide working and beadwork and quill work. Um, but there were a few examples of, of bats, uh, baskets and mats that were produced. And what you see here is a, a basket that was used in a dice gambling game. This was owned by my great great grandmother and is at least 150 years old. And what it was done is was used in a game that the women would play while the men were uh, ostensibly out hunting bison. And they would make wagers based on the predicted outcomes of the dice as they were cast in the basket. And the basket itself would be picked up, shaken and slammed down the dice would pop up and they would make wagers based on, on how they thought the dice would turn up. When I began my career in anthropology as a college student, I wanted to learn more about baskets and was studying with my former professor, Jim Adavasio, and became interested in learning more about these baskets. And I came to find out there was actually very little in the ethnographic literature about these baskets. And that became the focus of my uh, first research project as an undergraduate student and very much launched me on the way to continue to do what I have been doing, looking at perishable technologies in the Americas and beyond. Now, eventually, what it did was lead me to ask more questions about the basic technology, that is coil basketry and where it came from and how it spread all over. And questions such as why not every tribe uh, in the Americas makes coil baskets? Um, what is it that that's telling us about why people use that technology or where it arose and, and what do we make of it? So what this means is that in a broad sense, I think about recent and historic and contemporary weaving traditions practiced by native peoples, the Americas as the endpoint or destination. That is, it's the product of thousands of years of cultural interaction and adaptation to shifting social and environmental contexts. The imperfect and incomplete archaeological record provides clues as to how those traditions came to be. And this is very much a direct historical approach where we look to recent materials and work back to understand the past and how we got where we are today. So here you're looking at what is the oldest currently known example of coil basketry from the Americas. Uh, it's radiocarbon dated to uh, about 9,000 years ago. It's from a site in southern Utah uh, called Cowboy Cave. And one of the things that was immediately striking when this was uncovered is that um, it's not the type of basketry that archaeologists had sort of long been predicting that it should be. And that is to say that some of the earliest coil baskets typically came in the form of parching trays, large circular coil basket trays that were flat, shallow, almost like big uh, saucers. And these were used uh, to roast and parch seeds and nuts, which are an important dietary staple of many hunter-gatherer foraging populations uh, across much of the, the American West. Um, what I've done is, is here and, and throughout attempted to provide for you a little map to show you the, the approximate location of the site or sites that I'm talking about. Uh, I, I expect that you, like me, often appreciate that geographic reference, particularly when you're, you're talking about something uh, geographically so wide. Um, as it turns out, when I began to look more deeply, this technology uh, has produced examples that range, of course, from, from southern Utah, but all the way down into central Mexico. Uh, some of these going back almost as old, but not quite as old as 9,000 years ago. And the more I looked at some of the earliest examples, and I radiocarbon dated them, the more I realized that 
the earliest examples really didn't bear any evidence of having been a parching tray. You get examples of these small coil baskets and other bowls and the like, uh, even a tattooing needle from Texas that had a quilled basket as a handle. Nothing to indicate that they were used primarily in subsistence activities. And what this really suggests is that as we see on, on a, a wide scale with ceramic technology, oftentimes the reasons that technology are invented or, or come into being uh, acquire or are put to use in other applications for which they're particularly well suited. And that is to say that in the case of quill basketry it appears that while they might not initially have been used for processing seeds and nuts um, within the span of a several hundred to perhaps a thousand years, people very rapidly learned that it had the requisite performance characteristics to make it desirable for that activity. Now, in the Americas and many other places, uh, this type of focus study on perishable artifacts like I've been privileged to be able to do, is it's been neglected in part because of preservation and in part because it's a craft typically produced cross-culturally by women, uh, meaning that it was of less interest to early male anthropologists. In the last 30 or 40 years, perishable technologies have seen renewed interest as there's been a corresponding increase in scholars are visiting museum collections. Uh, I'm here speaking to you from Tucson, Arizona in the Southwestern United States, not too far from the border of Mexico. Uh, and I work at the University of Arizona at the Arizona State Museum and also teach in the School of Anthropology here. Uh, the museum here has one of the largest collections in the United States of ethnographic Native American basketry and also one of the largest collections of archeological organic artifacts. I've been, as I said, privileged to be able to study and continue this research and now train students. And of course, my approach has been largely informed by the history of North American archeology. span It's also really broad and inclusive of what I consider to be perishables. Uh, I, I talk broadly here about perishables to include not just baskets and textiles, but footwear, string, nets, uh, moccasins, all types of sort of other materials that might be made from plant or animal fiber or feathers that which generally decay in most archeological contexts. Um, Basketry, uh, I also think of as a, a, a variety of textile. Um, that is my, my definition of textiles is very broad and subsumes basketry. And the fundamental reason for this and the reason why a lot of people working in the Americas take this stance is that baskets fundamentally share uh, the great majority of structural techniques, weaving structures with textiles. And in fact, baskets are in many ways only different from textiles in their use of typically more rigid materials to produce three-dimensional objects as opposed to two-dimensional uh, continuous plane flat cloth or fabric. So in short, they're interrelated technologies that often overlap in materials, gender, and organization of production. Uh, my lab here is in the process of being reestablished, but I have been receiving and, and continue to receive perishable artifacts from all across the United States as well as uh, elsewhere in Mexico and Peru, as you'll, you'll see some examples of. Oh, and the, the big object here on the, uh, the, the, the bottom uh, right, it always gets a lot of questions and interest. This is a, we call it the PTM dome. It's a, for polynomial texture mapping, uh, which is a, a technique that is related to reflectance transformation imaging uh, or RTI, which is used to enhance the surface detail of uh, a number of artifacts. I like to use it for analyzing impressions of textiles and basketry in ceramics and clay and the like. Textiles themselves have received scholarly interest in the United States since the 1880s. Uh, this early work focused on impressions as I was just talking about. And a lot of this research on the negative impressions uh, of textiles left in ceramics remains important, especially in areas such as the Eastern United States and the Amazon basin where organic preservation is poor, but there may be ceramics. Combined with the physical remains of artifacts that come from extremely wet, dry, or cold archaeological context, we also rely on carbonized remains, materials that preserve through contact metal and the production of tools to flesh out that record. Fortunately, radiocarbon dating has helped us sketch out a picture of some of the earliest perishables made by Native Americans. And what I've done here is very briefly uh, pulled together a number of images of some of the earliest perishable technologies that we have showing their locations. Um, what we have sort of from the, the earliest uh, and this really is the material that we have that predates about 10,000 years ago, more or less, uh, from the Paisley Caves, uh, a series of sites in South Central Oregon. This dot here, uh, we have a, a selection of, of twined 
matting or basketry, a small fragment of which is attested from some of the earliest deposits you see here at the lower left. And that dates to about uh, 14,000 to 14,200 years old. That is currently uh, the oldest organic artifact uh, of any sort that I know of from the Americas. It doesn't look like much, but the very fact that it was directly dated uh, to over 14,000 years ago makes it pretty, pretty amazing, pretty phenomenal for us. Um, after that, we have uh, some bits of uh, preserved worked wood and string. Here you see some, some juncus stems that were tied around a stake from the site of Monte Verde in, in Chile, or Southern Chile. And this dates back uh, to levels that, that are bracketed by radiocarbon dates between about 13,000 and 12,500 years ago. There's also some additional material that's almost as old being uh, upwards of 10,600 to 11,100 years old from Huaca Prieta in Peru, uh, which is further north uh, in Peru. Some of the cordage and string and textile fragments that you see here are from Guitarero Cave in the highlands of Peru at an elevation of about 2,500 meters above sea level. Um, this material uh, is, is also some of the, the oldest bona fide woven material that we have, a fragment of a matting that bears uh, evidence of uh, residues and use for on the opposite surface. And I also like to call people's attention to the, the slightly carbonized fragment of extremely fine twining here. This is incredibly fine and incredibly small. And again, is, is directly dated um, to uh, about 11,400 years ago. Uh, some of the, the oldest cordage that you see on the upper left uh, looks like it could have been made yesterday and dates back to about 12,000 years ago. Thereafter, we start to see an increase in the, the preservation in the archaeological record. Guitaro Cave is here in the highlands. We go back up here to South Central Oregon and we're looking at a site called Fort Rock Cave and Fort Rock Cave is not far from the Paisley Caves. Uh, and there have been dozens of sandals from this and adjacent sites uh, that are of the style known as Fort Rock. This is in fact, as far as I know, the oldest footwear from the, from the world. Uh, these date back consistently between about 9,000 and 10,500 uh, calibrated years before present. A uh, really amazing style of, of footwear and the twining technique. So uh, these earliest records, although very small, tell us immediately that we're already, already dealing with well-developed and sophisticated traditions, and that Native Americans were rapidly adapting to new environments and plants and animals, uh, and they brought with them a great deal of existing knowledge and technologies when they came to the Americas. And so uh, from, from here on, what I want to do is rather than try and review the, a lot of the major weaves and weave structures, uh, I'll sort of run through briefly some highlights uh, or high points, as it were, relating to the, the art, artifact database from North America, Mesoamerica, and South America, and point out some highlights as I go, using some of these pictures of artifacts to give you a sense of variability in traditions that have survived. Um, if we start in the Eastern United States and in North America, we find that perishables from more human environments of the East are known mainly through studies of impressions in ceramics, the occasional burned or carbonized remains, and a few instances, there are some coastal deposits, sites in Florida uh, that have substantial waterlogged deposits. More uncommon are what you see here, which are examples of dry caves or rock shelters that have produced per perishables. This is a slipper from a site in Tennessee. Uh, there are other rock shelters and caves that can be found west of the Appalachian Mountains from the Midwestern United States and states of uh, Ohio and Kentucky on down into the Ozark Bluff rock shelters of Arkansas. Uh, these sites, importantly, have also yielded domesticated plants that have allowed the identification of a primary center of plant domestication in the east. Additionally, in some cases in the northeast, where indigenous peoples hammered uh, local copper cold, uh, they, didn't, they didn't smelt it, they were hammering it cold. Um, you also have a combination of, of cooler temperatures that prevail with soils that retain a higher moisture content, content and, and this ends up being ideal for the preservation of textiles and organic materials and associated with metal. Uh, some of these objects can range in age from hundreds to several thousands of years old. And what you're looking at here is a, a fragment of a extremely finely twined, uh, probably part of a, a, a belt or, or garter or strap from a site uh, on uh, the upper peninsula of Michigan. And this is a site that was inhabited historically by uh, Algonquian language speaking peoples, including the Potawatomi uh, and Anishinaabe. And with a Potawatomi descended student several years ago, I worked on this artifact. And what we did was when we first got it, it looked like the image that you see here it was crumpled up into a tiny little fabric ball. And you'll see the blue stains on the fabric. 
Um, it was buried in the soil from a uh, late 1700s, early 1800s uh, fur trade era site in Michigan associated with a, a chunk of copper. And what happens is copper and silver um, interacts with the moisture and soil and alters the chemistry of the surrounding sediment. And what it does is inhibit microbial decay, uh, excuse me, microbial growth and decay and helps preserve these textiles. And that's how we get some of these rare preserved fabrics. Uh, in this case, we were successfully able to uh, rehydrate it very slowly using alcohol vapors and open it back up. And that facilitated uh, I and the student being able to reanalyze it and her to ultimately make a few replicas of the fabric that were then returned to the Native American community uh, who is aff affiliated and connected to the landscape that the site came from. And we hope that it continues to travel on with the object uh, and be used as a teaching tool. Heading further west uh, of the Great Plains, we find that the climate becomes increasingly drier and we have access to much larger collections of perishables preserved in caves, rock shelters, and alcoves. Um, these rock shelters and alcoves, of course, are providing additional protection from the elements. In some cases, the large above ground multi-story stone masonry dwellings occupied by Pueblo peoples and their ancestors yield well-preserved remains. And in these cases, we sometimes get well-preserved examples of textiles and baskets and sandals, uh, archery equipment and the like. And so on the left, you see two examples of the so-called sort of cliff dwellings occupied by the ancestors of today's Pueblo Indians and other groups. And then on the right, uh, one of the more famous above ground stone masonry dwellings from Chaco Canyon, a World Heritage Site. This is a view looking south of Pueblo Benito showing the back wall and some of what was originally the, uh, the multi-story, four or five story tall walls at the back of that Pueblo. Sometimes um, there are surprises, and uh, we, we find oftentimes not just textile fragments, but large volumes of footwear. Here you see a, a woven fiber uh, sandal made out of leaves of the yucca plant. Uh, this one is mix mixing the straps that would have attached it to the foot, but I draw your attention to the little jog up here at the toe. That little bump out um, first appears at sites like Pueblo Benito here in the AD 800s, AD 900s. Uh, and we think, a number of us think that it actually may be a, a symbolic uh, identification of a connection to people with polydactylism. Polydactylism is uh, an expression of um, an extra digit often occurring on the, the hands or feet. Uh, and there are in fact several burials from Pueblo Benito that have provided evidence of polydactylism. Um, what's fascinating is that this expression of perhaps a symbolic six toe on footwear shows up first at Pueblo Benito and then appears for several hundred years after throughout many other states in the region, perhaps signifying that people identified it with these special and important people. Other examples uh, of sort of unusual textiles and, and baskets that show up here, we have a basketry shield. Uh, we don't have a, a lot of evidence for historic shield use outside of hide shields. That is to say that hide shields that were used by the horse or equestrian based hunters of the plains. We know they were also used uh, at contact by a number of groups throughout the American Southwest in interpersonal conflict and violence. But these basketry shields are much larger. The shield that you see here is um, about 78 centimeters in diameter. Uh, and for a long time, the question of whether or not the handful of these that were known were actually used but might not have served as uh, symbols of office or, or, or badges of, of status. Uh, comes from the fact that I identified the tips of two wooden projectile tips, two wooden arrow tips embedded in the fabric of this particular shield, providing at least some compelling evidence that they were functional in defense against bow and arrow technology. Many of the largest such collections that come from the American Southwest and elsewhere were made before archaeology came a profession. Uh, and while we have thousands of objects of incredible preservation, we often have, unfortunately, little preservation or contextual information for these artifacts. And what that means is that there's often a lot of documentary or um, you know, archival archaeology to do uh, in sifting through the old documents to make sense of this. Now, of course, modern ethical and archaeological standards would not allow for excavation on such a scale today, but they remain critical sources of information uh, for uh, understanding the past in the archaeological record. Um, 
what we see in particular in these large assemblages is that we get glimpses into some of the changes in textiles and battery technology that correspond with or in time uh, some of the developments that are quite dramatic in the American Southwest, the transition from uh, nomadic uh, hunter-gatherer lifestyle to a settled farming lifestyle, the increase of evidence for social inequality, uh, and not the least, the arrival of domesticated plants such as cotton and maize or corn from Mexico. Uh, and with that, the introduction of new and varied textile technologies in the last thousand years. And what you see here is sort of a fascinating selection of objects that I was able to see at the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago last week during our, our national meetings, which were held in Chicago. You see a selection of coil baskets, phenomenal preservation. Um, off in the distance, you see there's a large burden basket for carrying uh, perhaps agricultural products or, or firewood, uh, bits of yarns. And these two objects here are actually a pair of crutches uh, that have hide pads that are stuffed with uh, padding that were, were used to aid a, a individual who was suffering from a, an, an ailment. Uh, on the right, we have here an example of a really common ubiquitous technology in the Americas, and that's a, a twined uh, fur or feather robe. This particular example is made from feathers of more than a dozen different birds. Uh, but this basic technology of, of a twine fabric made from strips of, of rabbit skin or bird skin is widespread throughout much of the Americas and is very likely uh, an ancient, ancient technology. Now, although there exists some other waterlogged collections from sites that come from the Pacific Northwest coast of the United States and Canada, um, they tend to be restricted to the last two or 3,000 years. And the largest and best dated collections of archeologic materials anywhere in North America that are perishable come from dry caves and rock shelters of the Western, of the Great Basin region in the Western US. Here we have the advantage of really detailed paleoenvironmental records and the abundance of the ethnographic and the environmental and archeological material has really helped drive the development of cultural ecology in American anthropology and has been really important to env environmental archeology span and the studies of foragers. Um, true loom weaving was, was largely unknown from this region, but we have a, a rich and deep record of archeological basketry. And what you see here on this map is an illustration of some of the major regions of basketry that have been defined based on analyses of large numbers of, of organic artifacts. Uh, and in fact, uh, my, my former uh, professor and, and, and mentor, Jim Arvaso, did a lot of this work with his students. And we have sort of three major regional centers defined here. And what we're looking at are, are stylistic patterns that are akin to what we might see in ceramics or projectile points, although these do not map perfectly onto those uh, stylistic patterns in, in projectile points in the archaeological record. What we see here are, are, are some indication of broad patterns of regional interaction. Uh, areas that indicate greater internal interaction than with neighboring groups, but of course there is some evidence for trade and exchange. And in some cases, it's this type of large scale patterning over the long term in the record of the Western Great Basin and Eastern Great Basin regions that have allowed us to sort of track uh, the movement of populations and talk about a uh, large scale population movement and mobility in the archaeological record. Uh, somewhat Similar to the, the geographically closer American Southwest, um, there are some dry caves in, in contiguous Mexico that have yielded abundant perishable remains, even if a lot of them remain relatively understudied. Um, as one moves south in more humid tropics, the record declines dramatically, and there are a handful of assemblages from waterlogged deposits. What we find are, um, in some cases, uh, waterlogged fragments of textiles that come from sites such as uh, the sacred cenote at Chichen Itza, uh, a mine site in the Yucatan Peninsula. But otherwise, outside of those, those handful of examples from the humid tropics, we don't have much except visual depictions. And here what you see are some examples of some of the sumptuous textiles that were worn by Mayan elites uh, a thousand years ago. However, some recent discoveries are sort of improving our, our picture of the record. Uh, you have here an example of a a very rare and finely knit uh, agave fragment. And yes, I, I do say knit as in uh, knitting technology. It's commonly understood that knitting is a uh, Spanish introduction, but in fact, um, this dates to about AD 900 and, and is uh, a knit fabric, not made with two needles, but the structure is knitting. So uh, we have good evidence for that technology. And of course, uh, increasing evidence for basketry and textiles from the site of El Gigante Cave in Honduras, which has also produced a really remarkable record uh, with some cordage or string that has been radiocarbon dated over 10,000 years ago. 
Uh, so the record's improving through new research and restudy of collections. In South America, we, we have the coastal deserts uh, that are in the rain shadow of the Andes Mountains, uh, large cemeteries and architectural complexes, but there's little from higher elevations except for caves like Guitaro Cave and some of the frozen landscapes at the highest elevations. Uh, looting remains a problem, particularly for, for uh, disadvantaged peoples uh, throughout large swaths of the Andes, and urban development is also a problem. Uh, a lot of the perishables in South America come from coastal sites, and what you see here is a selection of some of those from, from Peruvian uh, Andes, and, and to some extent, even some lowland coastal sites are represented. A lot of research here is focused on, on cotton and camel domestication, uh, and these have shed new insights into the role and relationships of raw materials and influencing the development of some of the most technically sophisticated weaving structures in the Americas. Impressions in ceramics are also shedding new light on weaving traditions from the eastern flanks of the Andes down the Amazon basin, but few other sites in South America have yielded much. Uh, and in fact, what you're looking at here is really a, a nice representative example of some of those technologies. We have some of the, the coastal chinchorro uh, textiles associated with mummies, some of which go back 7,000 years, uh, some impressions of basketry and, and other fabrics in ceramics from the eastern flanks of the Andes in the, in the Amazon basin, and actually some uh, textiles from northeastern Brazil, some baskets and matting fragments uh, that my friend uh, Rodrigo Les Acosta analyzed for his dissertation research and was able to synthesize. Uh, again, here we're, we're working with a lot of gaps in chronology and archaeology, and this is a great example of where we have to rely heavily on the ethnographic and historic records to sort of work our way backwards. Now, by way of working towards the conclusion, um, what I want to do is, is talk a little bit about how, you know, we can identify the gaps in the archaeological record. We continue to conduct new and original research, uh, but it remains that, you know, we're most successful in archaeology when we're engaging with issues that both highlight and combat uh, issues that, that speak to contemporary society. We need to be able to respond to society's changing wants and needs. Uh, and that entails working effectively with the public and descendant communities. Uh, and I think that's where we can be and are most successful uh, is by providing an opportunity for diverse publics to engage in respectful dialogue. This allows us to learn about and from one another so we can face global challenges uh, that together. Um, and this is a, amounts to, in, in more recent research, a serious concern with social justice and environmental change, uh, and in particular, climate change. Uh, these provide a lot of opportunities for us to engage in this type of applied scholarship while also advancing scientific knowledge and looking at different people's long-term relationships with plants and animals in the environment. Uh, I've had a long collaborative relationship with the Seneca Nation uh, and other groups. Uh, we've collaborated on the analysis of organic artifacts. This was a project that Jay Toth was interested in, uh, looking at some of these poorly understood perishables that linger in museum collections. The climate change angle is being well pursued by research uh, and scholars such as Craig Lee, who've been doing this ice patch archaeology, which is akin to uh, glacial archaeology, and is allowing us to uncover evidence of human use of, of high elevation landscapes, build chronologies of human loose use of these landscapes, and be able to map those chronologies onto environmental data that help us understand how people responded to changing environments. Uh, this particular basket that I analyzed was uncovered on the edge of an ice patch and is remarkable because the vast majority of implements that they recover, the artifacts they uncover, tend to be associated with male dominant activities, largely hunting. Uh, and this recovery of a basket is one of a very few handful that attests to the work of, of women, the products of women, likely their their efforts engaged in seed gathering at higher elevations. These collaborative projects allow us to speak more to uh, social justice. Uh, in the Northeastern United States, among the Seneca, where there's a deep tradition of basket weaving, uh, you see here Penny Minner, who is a Seneca basket weaver. She works with black ash. It's a traditional basket weaving plant and, and form, and as well as making a, a host of other materials. Um, but over the last 20 years, the emerald ash borer has really uh, done a great deal of, of damage and harm to ash trees, killing them off in, in really large numbers, devastating ash populations. And what that's meant is that the ash trees haven't been available to reduce down to these splints to make basketry. And so what you see here are two baskets that I, that I purchased from Penny years ago. The larger one left reflects what she could do when she had a lot of ash. And now because of the absence and, and difficulty in getting ash, she can only make the small baskets. Um, recognizing how creative and innovative Penny is, and here she uh, adapted her doll making to include some recycled Amazon packaging materials. Um, 
I have here and, and more recently uh, in the Southwest begun exploring uh, alternative weaving materials. And that is looking at what we know about other suitable types of weaving plants, whether it might be cattails or willow or the roots of um, hemlock trees in the Northeast that provide a, a suitable means of replacing those plants. And what you see on the lower right is a bundle of those plants that I have in fact provided to Penny and some other weavers. We have stems of juncus uh, and, and strips of uh, dogwood and uh, hemlock root that I collected and processed uh, to provide to weavers as a means of sort of experimenting. This won't replace the black ash. It can't replace the black ash. But what it does do is, is hopefully provide alternative materials that will allow weavers to keep weaving and, and bringing in income. Uh, one of the final examples that I wanted to mention too before heading out here is some of the work that one of our graduate students has been doing uh, to rejuvenate uh, some of the, the lost traditional knowledge and dormant textile weaving technologies uh, within the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. Uh, Jennifer Byram has actually recently published a couple of articles on this work and has been working with another uh, larger group of Choctaw textile artisans and craft producers to uh, reproduce and fabricate textiles out of dogbane or Indian hemp, as well as bison wool and other materials uh, that, that can be used in their cultural center in Oklahoma, as well as uh, provide a, a a means of exploring uh, cultural survival and persistence uh, and, and a way of, of sort of re-exposing and disseminating some of that knowledge about these crafts that's buried in the anthropological literature. And it's, it's not just the, the descendant communities that, that, that benefit from this or, or who take this up on their own. Uh, of, of course, we have these strong collaborative relationships. Uh, and very much that is the case uh, in my recent work with, with my colleague, Martin Welker, uh, and some of our students here, and master weaver, Louis Garcia. Uh, we've been looking at some of the rare dog hair textiles. You see here a sash that dates to the AD 800s uh, from Arizona. And we've been working with Louis to understand use wear on spindle, uh, sticks and spindle whirls, as well as understand uh, some of the performance characteristics of dog hair as a raw material to help us understand uh, both how people worked with dog hair in the past, but also perhaps shed some light on the maintenance of dog breeds that might have been used just for their dog hair. So uh, viewed in a really wide regional context as I have and, and very quickly and very briefly, I, I hope that this brief introduction has not only illustrated some of the ingenuity and sophistication of indigenous weavers in the Americas, but um, that there's a lot of work that remains to be done uh, and hopefully also shown how there's ongoing research that is continuing to address a lot of basic anthropological questions um, that's going to contribute to our understanding of the past daily lives of technologies, economies, and ritual practice, as well as social interaction and boundaries. Um, I, I leave you with the observation that, you know, my prediction being that future advancements are, are going to come not only from new excavations, but research on existing collections and, and more collaborative engagement with descendant communities and other diverse publics who share an interest in what we can learn from the past to the benefit of our collective future on this planet. Our ancestors have lessons for us about how we can live together today uh, if we're willing to listen. Thank you for your time and for having me. Uh, thank you, uh, Edward, a very interesting presentation. Uh, for us, it's really impressive to see all this material because the remains of basketry uh, uh, in the Iberian Peninsula are very scarce, as you probably know. <laughs> it's very, very impressive all the material that you show us. Uh, uh, we can wait for a while for some question in the chat, but I, uh, I have many questions, but probably not time for all of them. <laughs> but I would like at least to, to make but there is a question of just a moment I will read for you. Uh, I was struck by the evidence of interaction between the three major regions observed through basketry. If I understood correctly, uh, could you expand a little more on this evidence of contact? Is it based on the decorative evidence, the raw material, the manufacture? Was also one of, the, my, quest of my questions. Yes, yeah, so um, can you still see my shared screen and the, the map slide, the overview slide? Yeah. Uh, okay, so um, 
This is a complicated question with a complicated answer. But on one level, yes. And it depends on where you are and when you are. So when we look at some of the earliest textile technologies that we have from the Americas, there is a, a lot of, of almost hemispheric unity. Um, we have twined weavings, baskets, and textiles that are uh, universally among the oldest. We also have examples of um, plated or interlaced fabrics uh, akin to the, the, the plain weave that a lot of us are familiar with. These are very ancient and in fact, they are fabric structures that are attested by you know, upper Paleolithic impressions uh, in the Czech Republic and so on. Um, here we see a lot of similarity in, in early mat based and bag technologies. These are somewhat um, expedient, uh, easy and quick to make. And they are also find parallels in some of the, the weaving technologies of uh, indigenous populations of Japan, like the Ainu. Now, I'm not saying that, that these represent Ainu textile technologies, but rather that we're looking at sort of a deep substratum of textile technology. And that's giving us some clue as, as to the time depth of these technologies. When we start looking at more regional scales, we do see there's, there's a lot of similarity uh, among traditions that are, are more closely related uh, in terms of geography or, or even language. Um, some of the more interesting parallels and contacts extend from Mesoamerica into South America and Mesoamerica from the uh, Mesoamerica to the Southwest. There's actually some really interesting research that shows evidence of very particular complicated weaving techniques in the last couple thousand years that uh, are earliest in Ecuador in Northern South America and then show up a little bit later uh, on, in Western Mexico and in Mesoamerica. And then they show up even later in the American Southwest uh, here in, in Arizona. Um, and some of these things, it, it's, it's too strong of a pattern to be coincidental. Uh, in other cases, we might find ultimately that some of these connections are owing to the spread of, of domesticates. We see that in the American Southwest where um, some areas here start to see the arrival of domesticated uh, corn and, and other plants at the same time as new textile and bastry technologies coming in. So uh, like in Europe, where there's the big debate about um, whether it's, it's people moving with the plants or the, the plants and people moving together, we get uh, similar situations here. But the questions of, of large scale contact uh, remain and, and are very interesting. Um, the origin of the vertical loom is, is a really interesting one. It, it sort of shows up fully formed here in Arizona uh, about a thousand years ago, but doesn't have any real clear uh, precursor in, in Mesoamerica or South America. And so we sort of wonder, you know, how are these things coming about? Is it just not preserved or um, have we missed something? Yeah, uh, I, I don't know if Paloma uh, uh, make this question in respect to the North American uh, regions that you show. I'm not sure. Yes, Paloma, because you show a, a map with the three main tradition of basketry in North America, no? And I, I'm not sure if uh, Paloma was asking for these two. Yeah, this. So um, this is, is in the Western U United States. And so these regions are, are pretty much confined to this area uh, here around the red dot. Um, and so we're talking about sort of one cultural region or province in the Western United States. And the, the large number of caves here has produced literally thousands of fragments of, of basketry and, and mats and, and, and textiles and the like. And study of these for you know, over 60 years by a number of people has helped identify these sort of stylistic regions. So they're basketry regions that are defined in this particular area on the basis of they have greater internal similarity. Uh, some regions like the, the Northern Great Basin tend to be predominated by a lot more twined weaving. Uh, and in fact, this is the same region that we're looking at with the Paisley Caves and Fort Rock Cave that have produced some of the earliest textiles uh, in the Americas have come from. And here there's, there's remarkable strong similarity between weavings that are 10,000 years old and weavings that were made several hundred years ago by the uh, Klamath and Modoc uh, tribes that, that live in the area today. And that's quite different in some respects than the, the populations that are in the Western Great Basin uh, around Reno, Nevada, or Lake Tahoe in California. These groups were all hunters and gatherers, and you see some of their baskets represented here. Uh, these particular groups uh, really excelled at coiled basketry. They made some twining, but 
their thing was a lot of coil basketry. And they obviously engaged in interaction with these groups to the north uh, because we find some of their baskets up in the north in, in some contexts. Um, when it comes to bigger questions about population movement, um, I will say that, that there's good evidence uh, that about 1,000 or 800 years ago, there was a large scale population movement, a spread of uh, Native Americans that spoke languages that are part of the larger Numic family. And the Numic uh, family is part of the larger Uto-Aztecan Tekken language family that includes uh, the Aztec uh, autumn groups here in the Southwest, as well as Hopi. So that sort of much larger language family has a smaller branch that um, is centered in Southern California. And it thereafter sort of spreads more recently in a fan-shaped distribution out of Southern California into this region. And we see, representing the archaeologic record, a dramatic shift uh, about 800,000 years ago. All of these baskets in this style that you see here, this large looted cache from the 1960s, this style of basket more or less disappears and are replaced by very different weaving styles. Uh, the cool thing is that where we start to see baskets that look most like these is over the Sierra Nevada mountains in California made by groups that are historically known as the Maidu and the Konkau and Nisanan. Um, so there's good evidence to suggest that um, perhaps owing to climate change and or conflict with, with these expanding uh, migrating hunter gatherers, they decided to, to walk on over the Sierra Nevada mountains and, and take up acorn processing as a, a preferable subsistence pursuit rather than uh, hang out in the, the dry lake marsh environments of Western Nevada. Yeah, it's very interesting the, the, this geographical difference because in the Iberian Peninsula, there are also differences no? it, in relation with maybe with the raw material that is available for each one of the regions. No? With this morning, we talk about uh, Sparto grass and uh, in the afternoon about the use of uh, of a uh, boot material for make baskets and it makes a very strong difference. No, I don't know if it can be the same in in the, this case in in the in, in North America. That's this relation between traditions and raw material and absolutely. Um, and and that sort of speaks in some ways to to some of the work that I've been doing more recently, in that um, there are materials that have been used in our traditional materials that have been. Uh, managed uh, by native groups for, for thousands of years. Uh, and when those materials cease to be available or no longer available, uh, it can have really devastating impacts. Uh, as, as I was sort of hoped to illustrate with the Seneca case, it just meant that weavers weren't, weren't weaving. Um, that lack of uh, availability materials meant that people haven't been able to weave. And so my hope is that we say, look, there are other plants here. Uh, we have willow, we have dogwood, we have the roots of hemlock. Um, which are similar to basketry plants used elsewhere in the United States by native groups. They might not be plants that, that people are today familiar with, but they're local, they're available, and would allow people to continue weaving. I think that's sort of a, a common approach that, that weavers have taken long in the past. When you look cross-culturally, a lot of times um, people entering new environments, they recognize different plants at the, the level of the family or genus. And so you know, from my own weaving experiences and knowing other weavers, uh, and you all I'm sure can attest to this, you recognize plants that have those qualities that are suitable for, for weaving. Um, and there's nothing really that's gonna stop us from experimenting with them and finding out what works and doesn't work. And so those plants that I was playing with in, in the Northeast are plants that I, I recognize for having those qualities and performance characteristics. And so uh, very much the weavers were keyed into that. They had their preferences. Uh, and we see that when it comes to, you know, preference for, for willow or sumac or other plants. And no doubt um, people, weavers felt similarly in, in Iberia as well. Yeah, thank you, Edward, for the answers. I think we are a little bit late and we have no time for more, um, for discuss more in deep with all these questions that are really very interesting. I, I hope you can stay in touch and, uh, maybe continue uh, discussing about all these uh, aspects in future. Thank you very that. much for, for this very interesting presentation, Eduardo. Thank you so much. You all take care and stay healthy.